My son Lev traveled to Israel this summer with Nifty. He went with other campers from Camp Harlem, including another boy from our own Temple Emmanuel. Despite the tremendous odds of the pandemic, Lev was able to make this fantastic journey. It required vaccinations, testing before departure, and several days of quarantine once there. But it also included climbing Masada, visiting Jerusalem, going to the beaches in Tel Aviv, and as he reported, the best hummus he has ever eaten. <laughs> At the end of the trip, the participants were each given a souvenir ceramic mug with a group photo on it, wrapped in nothing more than some tissue paper and tossed in his backpack. When Lev took the mug out of the bag, the handle had broken off the cup. Lev had returned safe and sound, but with something a little broken. Lev asked me if I could somehow reattach the handle to the mug. Did I mention that the handle was not only broken off from the mug, but broken itself into three pieces? As I pondered Lev's request and looked at the improbable, if not impossible, task before me, it seemed that this little mug held within it the last year and a half of our lives. Collectively, we are broken, and in more than just one place. Climate change, growing economic disparity, a long overdue reckoning on race, a lack of civil discourse, the growing unwillingness to behave in ways that advance the common good, and throw in a pandemic for good measure. And just in case we were not aware that we are broken, today we are asked to confess our brokenness, to beat our chests, to ponder our roles in this great mess. I'm not worried about my name being inscribed in the Book of Life for the coming year. I'm just worried about making it through today. How are we going to make it through? How will we find the energy and the strength to keep going? This is not, as the saying goes, our first rodeo. We have been practicing for this moment for years. Collectively, in just the last 40 years, we have lived through the AIDS crisis, the market crash of 87, the horrors of 9-11 and the Great Recession. Before that, World War II. Some of our parents and grandparents knew the deprivation of the Great Depression. Whenever we thought it could not get worse, it did. As we read in this morning's Torah portion, there will be times that feel blessed and times that do not. There will be times when God will bestow abundance through the work of our hands, and other times when we will feel scattered, banished beyond the horizon. We can read this portion as a cautionary tale. Obey God's rules and you will be blessed. Turn away from God and you will be cursed. Or we can take from this portion a message of hope and resilience. Yes, there will be bad times, perhaps even the result of our own doing. But God has faith in us. God says, for this mitzvah, which I command you this day, is neither beyond you nor far away. We do not have to ask who will go up to heaven for us or who will cross the sea to get it for us. God goes on to reassure us, no, this is so very near to you in your mouth and in your heart that you can surely do it. In other words, we've got this. The ultimate pep talk 
from the ultimate authority. Now, even if we are not so sure God seems to be, God is telling us that we are a resilient people. After all, our own Jewish history is an example of resilience. The destruction of the temple, exile, the Inquisition and Crusades, the Holocaust. But in today's portion, God is not speaking to us collectively as the Jewish people, but to each of us as individuals. Each of us can do it. God believes in each of us to find the strength or resilience to do it. Resilience may be a psychological term, but Judaism certainly embraces resilience. The key components of resilience are building connections, fostering wellness, finding purpose, and seeking help when it is needed. Isn't that what Judaism is about after all? We know that Judaism cannot be lived in isolation, and so it is with resilience. Both require connection. Building connections is about prioritizing relationships and nurturing them over the long run. Think about the connections you have made, friends that you still have from childhood. Look around this room. For some, there are people whom you have known for years, if not decades. At a recent bat mitzvah here, the guest included a group of parents, all of whom met when they enrolled their children in our early childhood education program. Those connections made in the carpool have blossomed into friendships between parents and friendships between children. Now, while self-care has been quite the buzzword over the last year, fostering wellness has always been part of Jewish practice. In fact, in the past year, Temple Emmanuel has helped some of you schedule your COVID vaccine appointments. From our prayers, which speak to the importance of a healthy body and a healthy soul, to support groups for those who have lost a loved one, Judaism and the Jewish community help us build resilient bodies and spirits. And we find purpose when we lend a hand to one in need, or find opportunities for self-discovery and broadening our horizons. We may find our purpose by studying Jewish texts together in Bible class or with holy scrollers, by joining worship with Rick Calvert at Simchat Shabbat, or as many as you have, by packing emergency food bags for those who are, who are hungry. There are also times when we all get stuck. It might be an emotional impasse or the inevitable computer problem. Sometimes things are just too much, whether it is a, fi a financial burden or an illness. Being resilient means knowing when and where to turn for help. And this is often where we turn for help, from sending a child to camp to receiving a hot meal, from a referral for social services to help with, yes, that inevitable computer problem. If COVID has taught us anything, it is the importance of connection. Isolation is simply not healthy for us. But Judaism, a religion that requires a quorum of no less than 10 in order to recite some of our most important prayers, has been teaching us this for years. God not only believes in our resilience, God has faith in us. Now we may think it's supposed to be the other way around, that we are to have faith in God. But in our Torah portion, God has faith in us to choose goodness and light over sadness and despair. Last week, both Becky Jay and I referenced the writer and professor Brene Brown. Turns out, Andrew Goldman is also a student of Brene Brown, and she was kind, and kind enough to lend me one of Brown's books, The Gifts of Imperfection. Brown thinks and writes often about faith. 
At one time, she, like many of us, defined faith as there is a reason for everything. I bet most of us have uttered those words without really considering if this is something we actually believe. But I don't think it works that way. Most of us are neither so sure of things, nor do we wish to ascribe to God every tragedy, illness, or mishap. Few of us really take comfort from such a glib saying. If in your own pain, someone has uttered those words to you, you know all too well how hollow they rang. Brown offers a definition that is at once both universal and so very Jewish. Brown defines faith as a place of mystery where we find the courage to believe in what we cannot see and the strength to let go of our fear of uncertainty. This is so Jewish. Just think about it. Jewish belief offers a number of ways of imagining God or what happens after we die. We have embraced our uncertainty. Faith is not always about being certain, but faith is about being able to live with uncertainty. As Anne Lamott writes, the opposite of faith is not doubt, but certainty. God has faith in us to embrace the mystery and to let go of the fear. When God exhorts us to choose life, it does not mean there will never be times of brokenness or uncertainty. We do not have to have all the answers. We certainly aren't born with road map, maps. But it is our faith that allows us to embrace the uncertainty and the brokenness. There will be times of wholeness and times of brokenness. Things may be a little broken right now, but that's no reason to give up. We can fix it. Kintsugi is the Japanese art of putting broken pottery pieces back together with gold, built on the idea that embracing flaws and imperfections, you can create an even stronger, more beautiful piece of art. The store did not have any gold, but they did have glue. Lots of it, in fact. I guess a lot of things need fixing right now. Nothing like finding a commentary on our state of affairs right in the home improvement aisle of Target. But I bought some glue, and I did my best. <laughs> you can see the cracks, and while I'm not sure it is stronger or more beautiful, it is mended, not just with glue, but with hope. According to the 16th century rabbi and mystic Isaac Luria, God created vessels into which God poured God's holy light. But these vessels weren't strong enough to contain such a powerful force, and they shattered. The sparks of divine light were carried down here to earth, along with the broken shards. Put another way, there's a crack in everything, but that's how the light gets in. <laughs>